Thank you. It's really great to be here. Um, uh, this um, conference has been put together in such a fantastic way. And I, I know each of you comes for different reasons, but I'm sure you're each going to take away a lot because there's a very rich menu here today. And um, the uh, Environmental Health Project is doing such great work uh, to get a baseline on uh, what people are actually experiencing and to help us think through what it means, you know, what, what people are going to be uh, encountering. I, I do have the hope that because I come from New York where we do not issue any permits for high volume horizontal hydro fracturing that <laughs> there will be a little bit of sunshine in, in the morning that has so much that's so heartbreaking. You know, to watch a presentation of what is being done to people in our communities is very, very difficult. So the, the title of this talk, Public Health and New York's Decision to Ban Fracking, in New York, we made public health the priority. And that is something that is possible to do. It is not being done in places where the oil and gas industry has a, a stronger presence and got started earlier. So we'll talk a little bit about what's different about New York, but one of the main things was in 2004, we were presented as a decision, do we want to start issuing permits for this activity? Whereas in other places, that decision point was rolled right past. And so what, what is the key element of dealing with this industry? In my mind, the way we were able to be successful in New York, even with the fact that we recognized a decision point, is that we put together what I call devastating data. The, this industry is bad. The question is, can people see that? Can we force them to see it? And the way to force them to see it is to do it with data. And that's difficult because the industry controls its own sites and fields. So we can't do the same kinds of research that we might do if we had a cooperative industry or if we had a more contained uh, setting where, where we had control. And funding for research into this industry and its impacts was um, turned off. The spigot for funding for research for this was turned off very early on. So you had the situation where you had no funding for research and you had um, no control of the sites where you would do the research and very little research was done uh, for the first several years. Um, this industry really began to grow in the past 15 to 20 years. Research, as I'll show you, only began to develop in the past 10 to 12 years. Fortunately, there are now two resources that I can send you to. Don't have to send you to 100 research resources or 700 resources because they've all been pulled together. And these are the two that are on the, the slide and that are the handout. Uh, one is the compendium of scientific medical and, me and uh, media findings demonstrating risk and harms of fracking. And the other is a recently published paper, but research that's been available to us, especially in New York and other places working on this for many years, um, the Hayes and Shoncroft's categorical assessment of the peer-reviewed scientific literature for the past six years. And we're going to talk about these two resources in detail because they're part of your major part of your toolbox of how to change things here in Ohio. So the compendium. I worked on this with a group of people called the Concerned Health Professionals of New York. We were, are and were a loose association of physicians, veterinarians, um, public health, occupational health, uh, and uh, researchers, um, basic science researchers who were looking at toxicology and things like that. And we decided to put together what was available in the literature a few years ago because we felt that people needed a resource and that we were starting to see enough data that it could be powerful. So the title is important, Risks and Harms. Risk is something that hasn't happened yet. It's a threat of something. Harm is something that's already happened. 
And especially in this field, since we didn't have good public health prevention, we have a lot of harms. So we don't want to always talk about the risk of fracking. We want to talk about the harms of fracking. We have a health and safety orientation. That was how we decided what we were going to try to pull together. And we decided that we wanted to pull together things that um, uh, information that had a scientific methodology. So we wanted things that were data-based and that were verifiable. But we also wanted to be inclusive because a lot, since there was very little research being done in the traditional way that we think of research, a lot of the information about fracking that was coming out was in the media. The media was going and doing good investigative journalism or they were just showing up at a site of a spill or an explosion and reporting that. And those are data points. You have an explosion, you should notice that you've had an explosion. You have an earthquake, you should notice that you have an earthquake, especially if you didn't have earthquakes in that area before. So we included the media reports, the investigative journalism. We also included the agency reports. There were agencies in various um, states that were doing this activity that were putting together um, materials that we could include. Um, and peer-reviewed literature to the extent that it was um, coming in. We, we made our uh, compilation chronological so people could see the most recent um, information first and we're keeping it up to date. So we've had three editions so far and we're now working on the fourth edition. We hope to have that in the next month or two. We focused on studies that show harms we thought that the industry was doing fine talking about you know, whatever studies they have showing no harm and we needed to narrow our universe a little bit. Um, so this isn't comprehensive and the industry has attacked us on that, but that's okay. We, we knew it wasn't gonna be comprehensive. Wanted you to know whatever has been shown that is data-based and independently verifiable that is a harm. Then we can go start worry about how, what the percentage of times that you see that harm but we have to know that there are harms. And during the time that we started this, the industry was still saying there are no cases of harm, right? It's never happened. This was two or three years ago. We're not hearing so much of that anymore. So that's a good sign. Um, the health professionals that had gathered together edited and abstracted and provided summaries of these. And the summaries are written for the lay audience. So we wanted um, legislators, lawmakers who might not have a background in science to be able to have access to this information. So each of our entries has a little short summary. And it's organized by categories, so if you've got a fracking waste problem, you can go to the section on fracking waste. And we published it online and we gave copies to relevant decision makers. During the time that we were doing this compilation, our uh, colleagues over at Physicians, Scientists, and Engineers for Healthy Environment were putting together a database of all the peer-reviewed literature. And that is, has different function um, because it is comprehensive. They were including things that would show uh, any study of health impacts, air quality, water quality that was published in the peer-reviewed literature, whether it showed there was a harm or not. They wanted to know if you went out and looked with our traditional research model, what did you find? So the, their compilation is also has a scientific methodology, but it's different. It's a more it's a literature review and a meta-analysis. You know what's in the literature, and so they only included peer-reviewed uh, research. And it is comprehensive, but within those parameters they defined. Uh, Jake Hayes and uh, Seth Shuncroft did this um, uh, primarily with their colleagues at PSE Healthy Energy, and they have now published this. Um, they also gave us this data in an ongoing way over the past two to three years, so we used it very forcefully in New York. Almost every time we presented the compendium, we also took um, their peer-reviewed literature analysis. So as I mentioned, the compendium uh, has categories. It has 17 categories. I just want to take a little bit of the time that I have to, to point out a few things about five areas, or how many did I have? Ended up with six. Um, I want to say a couple of things about air. I have that air uh, impacts are seen at local and global levels. It's local, regional, and global. So the local impacts are the ones that 
Raina Ripple was talking about, that we have people getting sick immediately. And the global impacts are primarily methane. And that's less visible, it's less immediate, but it's equally important. And at the regional level, you see both happening. So the, this is an area where the, what is happening in the air is we can see immediate harmful effects at the local level, but we also have to be thinking about the longer term effects and making that visible. I drove up, uh, arrived at the airport, and there was a van that was labeled clean fuel, clean air, a propane um, powered vehicle. In the county where I live, we have um, we had a decision about bringing in propane uh, powered vehicles for our county. We decided not to do it because we actually did looked at the information and found that propane actually burns less clean than methane, natural gas. So if you're going to, you know, say you want to burn clean, use the natural gas. Why is why is propane being pushed? Well, because the industry has all this wet gas with propane in it. It comes up, it's not all methane, and so they have to get rid of it. So what have they done? They promoted propane as a clean fuel. What hypocrisy, you know? What, what audacity? Because if, if we really want a clean fuel, I mean, bite the bullet and go to natural gas, because propane is just a little bit better than ethylene, regular gasoline, in terms of how clean it burns at the tailpipe. So not to even talk about you know, getting the full life cycle analysis. We've got to keep digging in. And propane, so where does it come from? Uh, more than 75% of the propane in this country now comes from hydrofracking activities. And it's going up. That, that, that percentage will keep going up. So oh, what did we get? Uh, I think we have to close. Um, so water, um, water also we have to think in terms of short term and longer term. On uh, one of Raina's slides she said that air uh, effects will be nearly ubiquitous or um, predictable. I think water effects are also, it's just that more of them are longer term effects. So we'll have the disasters like you had here I think in Opossum Creek, you know you'll have a spill and you'll have a disaster. Um, uh, like the Dimmick um, situation where you have a breakthrough or a blowout. And that's the immediate water effect, and that will be a smaller percentage. So you'll think water effects are less common. But for a couple of reasons, I believe that water effects are going to be nearly ubiqui ubiquitous over the longer term, over years to decades. And the reasons are these. One is that we're, the way you do this is you pierce through down to the shale layers that you're going to through aquifers in most cases. And you put casing on to protect. Well, those casings do not last. We know that a lot of them leak right away, and that's part of how we have some of the immediate water effects we're seeing. But that's the immediate. The research that's available shows that that gets worse over time. And over the long haul, decades to centuries, that should be you know, nearly a certain phenomenon. Every time you drill, you go through an aquifer layer, you're going to have a, an eventual water impact because you're creating a connection between those two, unless some natural force closes it down. Um, and the other way that I think you're going to see long-term effects um, that the industry denies is that this industry creates fractures in the underground rock layers. And they claim that there's this frack barrier that prevents anything that they put down below the frack barrier from getting above. But in some of the research that has been done, some of the research that has been claimed to show negative impacts, if you go read it into the details, there are diagrams done by the USGS showing fractures above the frack barrier that are caused by their test wells. So in the few situations where we've studied in depth and done um, uh, monitoring during fracturing. Among those few examples that we have, there are many of them that show fractures above the frack barrier. So it's all up for grabs what's happening in that black box in terms of over time. 
which um, I'm going to jump down and talk about earthquakes next because I think it makes the natural connection there. Because here, here's the thing. You're seeing in Ohio the, the um, waste uh, disposal wells leading to earthquakes. And thank you, Ohio. You're also one of the places where we've been able to demonstrate that fracturing activity itself causes earthquakes. Now, I've been saying that for a long time because the literature from Canada, from Alberta, British Columbia, there's some in the UK and in, in Europe that has been suggesting this. Until it happened in Ohio, nobody in the United States paid attention. Fracturing itself creates fractures. Now, that's, that's the very bad news, right? What's worse is more, uh, some recent research that shows that an earthquake that happens on the other side of the globe can intersect through its pressure waves with any existing fracture we have. Now, this was a problem even before we started this activity. But if we're creating many new fractures, we are inviting the areas that are heavily fractured to have more and bigger earthquakes over time, even if and when we stop this activity. So earthquakes is my, my big fear, and I try to propagate that fear. Your lawmakers should be afraid. I believe that there were lawmakers in New York that were afraid of the earthquakes. Helped us big time. Um, waste, surface, and subsurface waste. The subsurface has the earthquake problem. The surface waste, unbelievable. We put waste in either pits or we, this notion that you can have a beneficial use for this waste, when you put this waste on the surface of the earth and you have any atmospheric condition, rain, snow, whatever, even dry weather, you have leaching of this material into your water sources. So this is, is really the third route by which I'm sure that we will see long-term effects in, in water. Because any place that has been um, storing this material without containment, which is almost all of the available storage, is a hydrological experiment which we know the result. This will run into the water. Occupational hazards I put on here because everything that we see at the site is going to happen off-site. And there is more funding and there has been a lot of research on occupational hazards related to some of these materials, like silica dust, and if we see that silica dust causes silicosis in workers, we can predict that if it is getting off site, which in most sites it is, we're going to see nearby people getting that condition as well. So we really have to pay attention to the occupational medicine realm and safety and quality of life. So some of the issues that we document in the compendium um, are not covered in the uh, Hayes and Shoncroft um, uh, paper because they didn't look at safety, and a lot of people separate that out. But I think for lawmakers and decision makers, explosions, truck accidents, spills, all of those things are to me a public health threat, even though they may not fit within a traditional medical model. So I just want to give you a little um, brief look at the uh, results from the uh, PSE Healthy Energy Study. Um, you can see on the, the graph on the left, papers in 2009 and 2010, peer-reviewed research papers addressing this topic, six in each year. And that is, if you follow that curve, that's an exponential growth curve, if you want to look at that. And what started happening is individuals who had gotten some f funding for themselves and started publishing, and then all of a sudden people were going, oh, there's something interesting. And they went and found some way to do some research and publish, and suddenly this is a field, and now there's even papers about the papers. When um, the um, uh, concerned health professionals of New York would go talk to lawmakers about this, we brought our chart with us. We found that we had to carry um, black electrical tape with us because the data was changing so quickly, we had to update our, we had these big uh, um, charts that showed this re research as it was happening. We had to update our chart from month to month because the line on the right was getting so high. And now in 2016, we have about 700 peer-reviewed 
uh, articles in the peer-reviewed literature, 80% of those are in the last three years. So now we have data in ways that give us some powerful tools. 84% um, of the papers that looked at health found adverse health impacts. 69% of the papers that looked at water quality found impacted water quality and 87% of the papers looking at air quality found adverse impacts on air quality. And all those papers are accumulated um, at the PSE site. Uh, so if you have an area of particular interest, you can go there and, and find those. So what were special features that led to our being able to ban fracking in New York State? And how many of them do you have here? that you can capitalize on, and if you don't have them here, what can you do so that you can get what we have, which is freedom for now from wellheads and all of the fracturing activity itself. We are, uh, as Raina said, ad having to address uh, the whole infrastructure. We have to address fracking waste. Um, and so we still have elements of the fossil fuel industry that we're working on, but we are so much better off. So how do we do it? And uh, you know, what, what lessons can we draw that can help other states that want to have what we now have, or even better? As I mentioned before, we had no existing permit system for hydro high volume hydraulic fracturing, and our agency officials recognized that a new permitting system was necessary and invoked our environmental review process to, um, to start that. Um, and that, that environmental review process includes public comment and the public really ramped up big time. We also have two large um, reservoir systems supplying unfiltered drinking water to millions of people in New York City and that surrounding area and in Syracuse. And very early on, our um, agencies in those cities said, you can't frack here in th these areas. Now, Syracuse doesn't have um, Marcellus and Utica Shale the way New York City does. New York City is pretty close. And they said, uh-uh. And they became big time allies. We also had, um, and still have, alternative and incompatible economies. We were able to make the case and make it quite successfully that wineries and breweries, which need clean water, uh, yogurt making, which needs cows that are healthy, and our tourism industry, um, and actually our arts industry, were incompatible with this activity coming in and taking over the landscape. So agriculture, tourism, and the arts were our, our industries that we felt that could not really survive the onslaught onslaught if the, this uh, industry came in. We also had, and I'm sorry to say it here in Ohio, we had strong home rule protection and it held up. Um, Ohio, as, as I did research before coming here, had strong home rule protection. And in it's this heartbreaking scenario, your legislature took it away and your um, courts said they could do that. And that is, that's a big hardship. But there are some ways to counteract that. So hold that, hold that thought. Um, we had bipartisan municipal opposition. So what that means is that if this didn't become a political issue in New York where it was, you know, one party was the Green Party and the other not. Or it became, we don't want this here. And the home rule issue was a real driver and, and unifier for us. We don't want this here, and we're going to all work together to make sure we don't have it here. Um, the environmental advocacy was very, very strong. And people think of New York as an environmental leader, but it wasn't anything like it is now. Because every community that didn't want this formed an organization. And I looked at the table at some of the organizations that are here, this is how you do it. You have to have in every community has to form a group that doesn't want this. And then you have to unify. What I haven't seen necessarily, whether it's here yet in Ohio, is that uni unity. We formed a group, New Yorkers Against Fracking. And it was hard because everybody wanted to fight this thing in a different way. 
we decided we had to line everybody up from criminalized fracking to work with the industry to improve the regulations and protect people as much as we could. And we had to prevent anybody from going past that whole line. So it was going to be every spot, every approach was going to be included, and it was going to join together to form this barrier. You know, we weren't going to have it. And we talked to each other on the phone weekly, sometimes more than once a week. And we came up with strategies, and we, divvied up, we divided the labor. Who's going to be the group that's going to send to the lawmakers and the agencies every news story from around the world that shows a problem with this? We had lawmakers and agencies getting email messages with newspaper reports, research that had been published. Sometimes they were getting 20 email messages a week with things that are happening. You think they could ignore that there was a problem with fracking? We would not let them not look. And what you have in Ohio here is just, it's understandable. It's this huge denial. Why? How can we even look at this? If we do, we're going to lose this economy that has been, we think, helping us, you know? And we think it's helping us a lot. That, that's up for grabs whether it is, but let's assume that it is, that it does help. How are you going to get by without that? How are you going to rule it back, roll it back if you already allowed it in? So it's, it's not something that anybody wants to look at because it could require hard work to deal with it. So it's our job to make it visible and make it imperative that it be addressed. We were also blessed um, with uh, intelligent, courageous, and well-informed government leaders. I think in higher percentage than in many places, but I don't know for sure. I can tell you that there are always intelligent, courageous, caring, informed leaders. Uh, uh, leaders, and it's our job to make find those people and make them informed so that they can always know that they're standing on solid data and that we have their back. Um, our, our communities that we reached out to were very diverse. We started with the health community. That's very important. You've got to find your health leaders and get them up on this and get them leading the way. But we also went to the business world and we went to the spiritual communities and we went um, to the artistic communities and we asked each of them to use their voices to make this change happen. We didn't know that we were going to be able to ban fracking. There were some of us who believed that we could and many who believed we could not, but we all said we had to do the work anyway. We had to work as if we could get this stopped and to work as if we could um, improve the situation even if we couldn't get it stopped. So what are the implications for Ohio? Um, the main implication is that successful transition is possible. Even though New York made its final decision not to issue permits just a, about a year and a half ago, we actually made the, have had an effective ban on fracking since 2004, 2005, when the industry started coming in and buying leases. I mean, they had leases there. So we have over 10 years, 12 years of history showing that you cannot have fracking in a state that has Marcellus and Utica Shale under it, and you do just fine. In fact, there are some indicators that New York is doing quite well. We certainly have a growing and very powerful renewable energy sector. Um, we've become seventh in the country. We didn't start out there. But by saying no to one thing, we at the same time said yes to something else, and it's a much smarter thing to say yes to. So, um, I think, yeah, seek to ban it here. That, make that your goal, to get, get to a point where you do not have this activity taking place. And, you know, that you don't have fracking waste disposal either, since that's so big here. It's very small in New York, so we left it to the side. It's big here, and it may be the first thing that you take on. You know, take on where you can have um, some effective leadership and where you can win. Um, get all these groups involved, and I think support the media. Get them on your side. 
Um, see if you can get them doing investigative journalism for you. Get nonprofit groups to do basic research, uh, the community research, um, as is being done around the country. And also, a journalism. You know, just go look at agency records. Um, I had invoke home rule protections as I was doing the research before I encountered the uh, sad news. So reinstate home rule protections. And where you can't do home rule protections um, against this industry just directly, like you can't regulate this industry here in Ohio at the local level. But there are other things. We started out this way in New York 10 years ago. We were talking about aquifer protection laws and highway and road use laws, because those are not preempted in the same way. But if you can't drive your truck certain places very easily, you know, it makes a different environment for, uh, an inhospitable environment for the industry. Um, participate in every opportunity for rulemaking at whatever level across the country. Um, I mentioned here that the EPA has a rulemaking period that's open right now about fracking waste, um, and the public comment period runs through June, so we send in comments. Send in an informed comment if you can, but if you can't, send in a comment. One of the things that we did that attracted so much attention to the, the community's opposition in New York was we just told people send in comments. Kind of made me feel bad because I knew the agency wanted informed, substantive stuff. I was so wrong. They, the industry got really important information when 70,000 people sent in comments about whether or not there should be fracking in their state. And it wasn't even, that wasn't even the question answered, but that's the message that they sent. Well, anybody's got to notice it when you start having tens of thousands of people sending in their opinion. And I've seen some surveys that suggest that in Ohio, fracking and fracking waste is not very popular. Well, we have to ask for what we want. If you don't want this stuff, we've got to say it, and we've got to say it loud and repeatedly. So I'm going to wrap up, and if we can, I'll take some questions. Um, be creative. Um, the the uh, Community Bill of Rights, great way to go. Um, I'm going to ask if I can work with some of the health professionals, because I was thinking about it with Raina's talk. You know, creative stuff just pops up, right? The um, particulate merit matter that carries the um, volatile organic compounds and gets into people's lungs worse because of the particulate matter. Um, I uh, purchased an air filter for a family living in Pennsylvania because I couldn't stand it. I talked to them and told them they had to leave. Their kids, their kids were having um, myoclonic jerks. Their muscles were twitching and they had behavioral problems and the fa parents and the family thought it was related to a compressor station nearby. Uh, and I told them to move. I said, I hate to tell you this, but you need to move. And they had noticed that it got better when the kids went to visit other relatives. And the kids were being put on um, uh, seizure medications, being treated for epilepsy. And it was actually helping, the seizures. But this was because they were having less seizure activity, they were staying in the contaminated airspace longer. So anyway, based on some research from Dave Brown and others at the uh, Environmental Health Project, I said, yeah, since I was talking to these people, I had to do something. I'm a clinician by training. So I said, well, let's get you one of these air filters. And we did, and it helped. It helped. So it's also part of demonstrating that that was the right causal mechanism. And since then, I've heard that that compressor station, with the, it actually had to revamp it. it was, um, the community pressures were so strong on the industry. So some of that leakage may have been improved. The point of that is, it just occurred to me today when Raina was saying that people can't necessarily afford these expensive interventions, we should get that covered by Medicaid and Medicare. And when that's covered by Medicaid and Medicare and they start seeing in the national offices all these bills coming in for these HEPA filters and whatever you can do on the water and vacuum cleaners and all this, Oh, then it's going to start to become a budget issue, you know. So be creative. Find these, these walls that look like you can't scale them because they're so sheer and high and wide. When you get up close to them and you start finding little places in there where you can get your fingernails in there, there are ways in, and we have to do that when the going is tough. So 
uh, be creative, be persistent, build your renewable sector. You know, every person here should have solar on their house and some kind of alternatively powered vehicle, whether biodiesel or uh, electric, um, and be ready because disasters will happen. You know, when you have earthquakes, you need to jump up and say, we told you, it's a dangerous industry, we can't do this anymore. So anything bad that we can't prevent, we have to use. And as I said, we unite, um, which is why I'm so grateful for you inviting me here. Um, you know, anything that we do have in New York that we can give to others to help make it better, I want you to have. And I'm very happy to work with you and hopefully going forward in the future. If there are health professionals, including veterinarians, um, who are interested, in it, we did have a concerned health professionals group in New York, then in Maryland, which achieved a partial ban and some little partial victories, formed a concerned health professionals of Maryland. Um, maybe Ohio will be next. Thank you very much. <laughs>